Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Success Grid podcast with your host, Hussein Talib. My guest today, Matthew Turner, he's a British author who wrote his latest book, Beyond the Pale, on the back of interviewing hundreds of successful entrepreneurs, authors, investors, and thought leaders, as well as writing his own books. Matthew ghost writes both articles and books for other successful entrepreneurs. Matthew, welcome to the grid. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Awesome, awesome to be here. So give us a background about who you are. So your books, how many books do you have? And why do you do love writing, apparently? Yeah, I do indeed. So yeah, here's Beyond the Pale, and it's my fifth one. So fifth published one. There's been a few other short stories in there too. And yeah, I've had a bit of a love affair for writing since my early 20s. It mm-hmm. wasn't something I did at school. It wasn't something I, I grew up with necessarily, but I always had this love and a passion for storytelling and using my imagination. And I turned to writing as a form of therapy, really, in my early 20s, just kind of start getting my thoughts from head to paper so I could better understand what was going on. And very quickly, I started to not just journal my thoughts, but turn them into stories. Mm. So that happened, I was around about 21, I'm 37 now. So I've been writing throughout that period, but I would say I've only really been writing seriously probably for the past 10 years. So for the first six or seven years, I was writing my first book, but then I would put it in the drawer to one side, I'd come back to it. And it was just a bit of back and forth for quite some time. And then around about 2011, 2012 is when I decided, no, I need to finish this book. And into doing so, I need to like learn how to properly write. I need to get my work critiqued. I need to work with an editor. I need to learn about my craft. And ever since then, I've just found myself diving deeper and deeper into the rabbit, the writing rabbit hole. Not just writing my own books, but writing for clients, as you say, I ghostwrite, whether it's articles or, or books. And yeah, I've worked with some pretty cool people over the last few years. So writing is very much a part of my life now, a central part. And if you'd have spoken to Matthew at the age of 16 and said, one day you'll be a writer, he would have probably laughed in your face. But uh, it's strange how life works out sometimes. Yeah. So so the journey of writing a book, you, you apparently did multiple books now. So your latest book, how, how do you approach each book? Is it the same thing that you do? Is it a routine or do you do different things to different things when you write different books? Yeah, so every book's a bit different, but I approach the process the same. So Beyond the Pale is a fable. It's it's a bit of a mix between fiction and non-fiction. My book before that was The Success Mistake, which was a fiction book where I interviewed 160 odd people about failure and how they turned into success. Mm. And my other three books were, were pure novels. So I've done a little bit of everything. Every book's a bit different because a non-fiction book like The Success Mistake required a lot of interviewing. And then I would have to transcribe those interviews, make notes, try and make little stories out of each interaction and then bring them into the story. Whereas when you're writing a novel, it's just getting in what's in your head, your imagination and creative Mm. churning and bringing that onto the page. But in terms of a process, it's kind of the same each time. I'm I'm actually just in the middle of the early stages because Beyond the Pale is the first trilogy. So I'm starting Mm. to work on book two, um, which follows the sequel to Beyond the Pale. And it starts with a a few weeks, and I've been doing it the last few weeks, just kind of getting the research together, deciding which books I'm going to read and which videos and the type of people I'm going to interview. And I just kind of create bullet point lists. I call it just getting your hit list together. So just any thoughts and ideas in your head, get them down on paper. And it doesn't matter whether there's any order or structure to it. It's just getting thoughts from head to screen. The next stage then is to start structuring it. So that's when I'll start getting a bunch of, I've already kind of got them ready here, like a bunch of uh, cue cards and post-it mm. notes. What I'll probably do is remove the, uh, the pictures behind my head and just use that wall as like a storyboard. So I will start thinking about what the journey looks like throughout the book, middle, beginning, end. 
And then I'll start thinking about the different key narratives that will overarch and thread through them. And from that, it helps you then go, okay, well, how many chapters are going to go in the beginning of the book? Mm. And how many chapters are going to go in the middle? And how many chapters are going on the end? And then you just kind of start adding more and more layers to this storyboard, you know, for each individual chapter, for each individual scene. Once I have that on my wall, I just kind of look at it for like a week. I just immerse myself into it. And then it involves back into the computer, you know, transcribing all those notes into something a bit more structured on the screen, developing characters, and really kind of honing in on the different locations and doing research there. And that process can take anywhere from a few weeks to a couple of months. And, and then the writing starts. Mm -hmm. But again, once the writing starts, that's when the journey takes a unique um, path because every book is, is different. So sometimes it, it's very easy and you get a first draft done in a six to seven weeks. Sometimes a first draft might take six or seven months. <laughs> it really is difficult to do, determine until you dive in. So right now I'm in like phase one of the process. As of the, uh, probably starting next week, actually I'll start diving into phase two using this wall. And then in the early parts of 2022 is when I'll start stage three, which is the, the writing. And who knows how long that'll take. Yeah, so you mentioned sometimes you have something quick. Sometimes it's like takes time. So is there something called like what they call the writer's block? Uh, is that what they call? Do you have that yeah. issue or there's nothing called the writer's block? It's just you see certain things are not in flow with what you already wrote. Yeah, it, I mean, it kind of is and isn't real. Like I've certainly had writer's block or creative block, but it's it's kind of, it's, it's an excuse mm -hmm. we, we have. And I, and I don't think it's something that is, uh, you know, just with creatives. I think we all come across that. It's just resistance mm -hmm. more than anything. So for me, whenever I've come across writer's block, it's because I reach a stage in the book that just seems harder than the rest. Now it might be harder because I just can't quite figure out the answer. I can't quite figure out what I wanna say. But more often than not, it's just overcoming some kind of obstacle. Maybe it's forcing you to think about something you don't wanna think about because it's a personal issue or it's mm -hmm. just something very heavy, it's a heavy subject. Sometimes it's other aspects of life just take its toll and you just feel overwhelmed and your mental health is taking a bit of a beating. So writer's block becomes an excuse when you're like, oh, I'm not writing anything because I've got writer's block. But really what it is, is just there's resistance there. There's some kind of blocker, whether it's a physical thing, whether it's a mental thing, whether it's an energy-based thing, whether it's to do with your work or your personal life, something in you or outside of you, something is there just blocking you from putting fingers to keyboard and diving in. So yes, that can be a reason why a first draft goes from taking a couple of months to six or seven. Other times it's just because it's a more complex story. With Beyond the Pale, for instance, there was parts of the book which came really easy because I, I, I had the, the notes transcribed because I, I interviewed about 10 people for the book. So there's certain aspects of the book where it was just me and my own thoughts it was just me talking about something that I had a lot of um, experience with. And it was me focusing on interviews that were quite recent and the stories came freely. Mm -hmm. There were other parts of the book where there was lots of people coming in and lots of people's stories. And it was quite hard to just rearrange the pieces and get them to flow. So sometimes you might get the first half of the book done in a couple of weeks and then it takes you a couple of months to get through the next 10 pages. So that's why I say every book's different. It's a very unique journey. But yeah, writer's block, it does play a role. But more often than not, it's just an excuse. It's just a different form of procrastination. Yeah. And as with everything, you know, it's just discomfort. And if we want to achieve anything in life, we have to overcome that discomfort yeah so speaking of this uh, writing block do you do for example do you do a lot of modification when you finish the whole book for example or do you do the modification or adjustment for example each chapter by itself when you for example finish like you think oh i'm now in the half uh, half of the book so i will go back and see and do some tweaks there or do you stay and finish the book first 
it's a really good question. And thank you for answering it. And first of all, know that every writer is different. Some writers like to just get the first draft down, even though it's going to be ugly and horrible. And then they go back and do a second draft. Other people like me have a slightly more layered approach. Mm. So what I like to do is, and again, this is where the, the structure mm. that goes up on my wall helps because it, I'm able to set like certain milestones in the story, whether that's beginning, middle and end, or whether there's maybe like a couple of phases in the beginning and then another couple of phases in the middle. It, it gives me certain milestones and benchmarks. So I will write freely, usually, maybe it's for as little as two chapters, maybe it's seven or eight. And then I reach that milestone that milestone along the, the timeline of the journey. And that's when I go back to the beginning and I like read up and, and edit from there to make sure that mm. I've not necessarily got those say six chapters perfect because you're never gonna get anything perfect during the first draft. But it reminds me of what I wrote in chapter one. <laughs> it, it allows me to make sure that the, those six chapters kind of flow quite nicely and there's no like huge issues along the way. And usually it gives me everything I need. It helps me get back into some momentum so I can work on the next section. So that might be another three or four or five, six chapters. And I'll do the same. I'll just kind of write free flowing whether it takes a couple of days or a couple of weeks or whatever. And then I'll go back to the start of that and then edit up until then. And then usually as I get towards the end of the book, before I complete the final few chapters, I will go all the way back to the beginning of the book mm. and do a final run through so I've, it's, everything's real fresh in my mind. So when I'm tackling those final few chapters, I still remember what was going on in chapters one and chapters two. So again, things are relatively tight. So I'm kind of editing the first draft as I go along. It's not like I'm constantly, you know, editing each chapter one by one, but there's certain milestones in the journey where I go right now, I need to go back to the beginning and you know read up until this point and do some light editing just to tighten things up but that way when i do get to the end of the first draft i know that i'm not starting on a broken wreck mm. for, for the second edit i know it's tightish it's along the lines and i've also usually made notes in a notebook of like chapter two for instance doesn't feel quite right i don't necessarily know what the answer is right now but there's something in there not quite you right. feel it yeah yeah, I feel it. And you don't get to see that when you're just writing and forget about everything else. So just revisiting certain points just reminds you of that character's not quite right, that location's not quite right, that ca quite that chapter's not quite right. So you, by the time you go into the second edit, you've got these notes and you're going in and thinking, right, how can I improve this book as I attempt edit two? Because that's what the second and third edit is all about. The first edit is just getting the story down it's about getting the story into the world the second and the third of it is about turning what is hopefully a decent story into a very good story so that's yeah. where the rewriting comes in and personally i find that side of things easier if i've done a bit of editing during the first sort of initial um draft mm -hmm. other writers are like no way i just tackle the first draft and then I will sort out the second edit and the third edit as they come along. So every write is different. It's certainly been my approach. I find it works for me. It sometimes is a more roundabout approach. It can take yeah. a little bit longer, but at least for me and my sort of mental well-being, you know, how I kind of focus and how I kind of um, obsess over certain things, it allows me to stick with my book, commit to it, and make sure I'm happy with it throughout. So, yeah, it's, it's an approach that works for me. Yeah, so like you mentioned, one thing you go back, you see, because sometimes maybe if you are in the flow and you wrote the whole book in one take, let's say some people say they write a book in one take, they have this kind of flow, but sometimes if you don't know where, for example, the story want to go, so you want to probably go back and see what you actually said in the first chapter or second or third to see actually what's going to happen because if you keep going at, at it without reviewing maybe it could go to another place you don't want it to go is that possible absolutely oh yeah absolutely i mean we were talking earlier about structuring and coming up with a timeline and it's, it's a good actually it's a very good question because there's a fine line between structuring your story 
book going too far because a book will evolve. You don't really know how the story is going to evolve until you start diving into it. So usually before I start writing the first draft, I like to have the first two or three chapters pretty baked down. I like to have a really good idea of like what the first two or three chapters look like. But then after that, I know that even though I've made notes for chapters four and chapters 10 and chapters 20, and I have a rough idea of the, the entire journey of the character and the characters are gonna go on, I know that by the time I reach chapter 20, you know, there could have been a little bit of a few twists and turns along the way. Things will change, the story will evolve, the character will evolve. So you don't want to be too rigid with your structure. So, because that just stifles your creativity and you end up sticking to the plan for the sake of sticking to the plan. But at the same time, it's nice to have that structure so you're not completely going off track every other second. But as you say, if you're writing it in one go, without going back and checking and doing a little bit of light editing here and there and just rereading at times, you can evolve too much. And your character could look like, you know, Homer Simpson at the start of a book. And before you know it, it's turned into Ned Flanders by the time you reach the final few chapters. And you're like, how the hell has this happened? So that's why I like to keep going back at certain sections, just so I can make sure that the character remains the character. That his or her journey, you know, remains intact, but it evolves the right way rather than just my mind just taking it on random paths because I've found a bit of flow or I fought this particular way this day and then I fought this particular way the next. So yeah, it's uh, it's helpful to have a bit of a structure. Yeah. So so do you have certain rituals like, for example, some people like to drink some tea. For example, you're British, so do, do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a tea drinker, actually. I'm not. I know I'm like the worst British person ever. No, I coffee. So mm -hmm. I really struggle to write. Like right now I'm at my desk. I really struggle to write at my desk. I need to be out in a coffee shop. So my ritual involves me getting out into my local town, going into one of my favorite coffee shops. So there's life happening around me. A nice, fresh batch of coffee. And then I just, I work away. Yeah. Mm. so that's kind of my ritual editing i can edit in coffee shops but i can also edit at home on my on my desk so editing once with editing i can do it in bed i can do it at my desk i can do it wherever writing i have to be out i have to be in a but, coffee shop but but it's, it's 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 noisy around you how do you keep track of things how do you can you focus and put things into paper when there is like sounds around you in the street and the coffee shop out there <laughs> usually usually I I, yeah usually you need some i think maybe i don't know maybe for me if i want to i'm not i'm not that i'm not that i wouldn't say i am a book writer that much but if i want to write something i would go to a quiet place sometimes i use for example to study we used to study as groups in coffee shops and these kind of things but when actually when that happens you lo you lose focus of things you start uh, drinking your coffee or whatever and you start talking and chatting and you forget the main <laughs> thing so <laughs> how does that work yeah, good for you yeah you you're the normal writer i speak to most writers and they're like how do you do that most writers like to write in silence they're like a nice view they like, yeah, that maybe a little bit of background music, but that's it. And, and that's a strange thing. If I was working from home and I had music in the background, I would struggle. But when I'm in a coffee shop and it's just life, I don't know. I find it, it makes it easier for me. If I'm writing in a quiet room, it feels very serious. It feels very pressured. I don't know. Maybe it reminds me a little bit of uh, like tests at school. You know, when you're in like a big hall and everyone's quiet and it's just so silent, it just feels very serious to me. Mm -hmm, Whereas yeah. when I'm out in a coffee shop, it just feels a bit lighter. It feels a little bit more informal. It's like, you can write if you want, but at the same time, if it's not coming, you can just have a little look around, do a bit of people watching. You can sip on your coffee. You can listen to a bit of music and let it allow your mind wander. And honestly, most of the time, I just find myself blocking it out. It's like, I'm aware of it. I can hear the grinding of coffee beans and the clatter of coffee cups. I, 
the background chatter from tables around me, but I just kind of blocked it out. <laughs> You're mentioning the movie. I think Lucy or Limitless here, these kind of things are happening. Like you you have like, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, you can get uh, around and hear everything, even if the, they are 100 meters away. You're hearing, the, you're hearing the light is turning green and turning back to red. <laughs> this kind of... I don't know if it's quite that good, but yeah, <laughs> to an extent, like I start, I, I'm aware of it all. I'm aware of what's going on. But, I, but it just allows me, and it's very strange, I can't fully explain it, but it just allows me to just kind of find that flow and just get what's in my head onto the, onto the screen and just tap away. And usually an hour, an hour and a half, two hours will just fly by and I'll have like a cold coffee because I've just been writing solidly for the last hour. <laughs> but it's, it's nice because sometimes that happens and you just fly through a chapter. It's just like, it's coming through you and out of you. And it's just like, it feels amazing. And it, there was the times where you're like, oh my gosh, if an hour's passed, my coffee's cold. But a lot of the times you'll, you'll, you'll work on a chapter and if a few paragraphs will just fly from you. Mm -hmm. And then you'll hit a bit of a point where you're like, hmm, am I actually happy with that paragraph? What's the next one going to do? So you can spend the next five minutes, you know, rereading a little bit, having to think of what you're going to write next. Mm. writing a sentence deleting a sentence writing a sentence and then you find your flow again and the next few sentences just kind of flow and another five or ten minutes go by so in my experience writing especially fiction is a bit more stop start like that you'll find some good flow and then you'll hit a halt and you'll hit a barrier of some kind and then you'll find some flow and then you'll hit a barrier and just being in a coffee shop allows me to just distract myself in a positive way I can just like I'm around people you know I can just look around I can feel like I'm a part of society even though I'm just in a little table in the corner on my own I can just have a sip of coffee whereas again if I'm just at home I'll get distracted by cleaning or doing something else around the house and the silence I just find very disconcerting it just reminds me of doing those tests at school it feels very pressured it feels very forced it feels very serious <laughs> and i don't like it when it feels too serious writing because it needs to be creative it needs to be uh, free you, you, ha you have to yeah. be in your own environment like it's a normal environment it doesn't have to be too extreme yeah. because it's, maybe in silence it's too extreme like when it's too yeah. noisy it's like in the middle kind yes of exactly i mean if i was in like a really busy echoey train station where you know it's just like a lot of echoing and like beeps and all that that's probably too noisy for me because yeah it's too much of an extreme the coffee shop i find it's just it, it just becomes white noise mm -hmm. because there's so many different conversations going on there's a bit of background music that you can just about hear yeah there's coffee cups there's all sorts of things there's nothing in particular nothing's too loud mm. there's no silence whereas you know right now i'm in a very quiet room so if I wasn't speaking to you and I was just sat here writing, it would just be so quiet. And I'd just be like, oh my gosh, this feels like I need to do a test. This feels too serious. I can't get into the flow. I can't get into the zone. Yeah. So what, what, what things that you faced as an entrepreneur or as an author, you had worst moment with, with that. It's on, with, when you are writing or in a certain situation in your business. I think just an, an ongoing struggle for um, you know me as a writer, and I think it's true for a lot of writers, is it's one thing to write a book. It's another thing to then get out there and sell it and mm. market it and promote it. And it's, it's a strange dynamic because as well as being a writer, I'm also a reader. And there are so many books out there. And there's not just books, there's podcasts, there's YouTube channels, there's courses, there's articles, there's blogs. We're surrounded by content. And I'm sure you have similar things with the podcast. It's one thing to create. It's another to get listeners and to get engagement mm -hmm. and all these things. And it's amazing. We all have this opportunity to create and to share what we create openly with the world. But there's a downside to that. And it's, there's just huge competition and there's a lot of noise. So the hardest thing for a writer these days, and I don't think it's unique for me, is to just make sure that the book isn't only the best it can be, but then you're recommitting to that book like every week, every month, you know, asking yourself, what am I doing to get this book in front of people? Mm, what am yeah. I doing to promote this book? What am I doing to sell this book? And not just doing it around launch, which I've been guilty of in the past, but a month later, 
six months later, a year later, constantly bringing it back like the book that I've written, like it took time, it took energy. What am I doing to make sure the people who need to read it, read it? So selling a book and promoting a book is by far, at least in my experience, harder than writing one. Writing a book is difficult. It is. It's a, a true journey. But promoting and selling a book is a whole different ball game, mm. And it's interesting. There's a lot of trial and error. I've had certain things which have worked. I've had certain things that haven't. But yeah, it's something I continue to dive deep into all the time and experiment with. And it's, it's a progress. It's a process, mm. shall I say. Yeah, uh, being an author is one thing and developing or marketing the book and having campaigns is, uh, is a whole other aspect and other business in it by itself, yeah. So It is. Uh, yeah, so um, what what made you actually want to, uh, let's say, do you want to, for example, expand beyond writing uh, more into business, more business ventures or other things like, for example, coaching, other authors for example mm. well funnily enough for beyond the pale it's like i say one book of three or it will be three books and there's a community and experience that's mentioned in book one and will play a large part in the second and third books called so rio and it's it's not a course or a program per se but it's a community, it's an experience. There's like going to be real world retreats and there's elements of coaching in there and program aspects. Um, the the long-term vision isn't that, that I will necessarily do a lot of the coaching and the mentorship, other people will too. But um, but yeah, that's, that's starting to be, develop and starting to build a bit of steam now the book's out. So that's, um, you know, another part of the business. I mean, as you know, like any business needs several income streams. And as an author, you know, right now, like I'm very much the business and hopefully in the future, the business will involve a bit of a team, not a large team, but there'll be people involved other than just me and my assistant. So once that happens, you need to always look at different income streams. You know, the book is one thing, but what other income streams? So courses and programs and, and those coaching aspects. So yeah, I don't, I, I have no ambitions of becoming like this huge entrepreneurial figure where I've got very vast different business ventures. It's not for me. I love writing. I want to build a business around my writing, but I also want it to be as successful as it can be. I want it mm -hmm. to impact as many lives as it can impact. And I know writing a book like this is just one thing. It's just one way to reach people. There's so many other ways to reach people. And oftentimes people will read a book and they'll have their eyes open. And that's really what this book's about. My hope is that the readers read it, feel inspired, have their eyes opened. But there'll be a degree of people that then need help to actually implement what they've learned, to actually take action on their inspiration. And that's where the SO Rio experience comes in. Mm. And I imagine the SO Rio experience will open up new avenues with events and mentorship and masterminds and things like that. Mm. So I'm, I'm cautious with it. I like to take baby steps and allow things to evolve, you know, bit by bit by bit. So yes, there's room to grow. I want to do things that expense, expands beyond writing, but I always want, writing to be the central part of my working world yeah so how do you deal for example with failure if you for example you wrote multiple books so if a book does, did not perform the way that you wanted or expected it to to, to do uh, how do you deal with that get back on a horse i mean i've had it yeah you know i've had books and i mean one of the great things a book is never truly a failure you know the books that I've written, they're, they're still there. They're still as relevant today as they were when I wrote them, whether it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So that's a great thing when you write something like a book. It's never truly a failure. You can always mm -hmm. re-promote it. If this book becomes like a massive global bestseller, all my previous books will, will be bought because yeah. people will be like, oh, I want to read his other books. So that's the great thing about books. There's no such thing as a true failure. So I just look at it as like, okay, what have I learned from this book? Both from the writing aspects, how can I improve it? And on the launching aspects, how can I improve that? And then the ongoing marketing and promotional aspects. 
So if one book fails or if one campaign fails or just something doesn't quite go according to plan, I just like to try and get back on the horse. You know, how can I make the next book better? Not only better in terms of the best book I can literally write, but how can I make it better in terms of reaching more people? How can I make it better in terms of making it more promotable, more, uh, more sticky, more memorable? And I like to think that every time I've done that with a book, the next one has been more successful in that aspect. But I learn lessons all the time. And, you know, publishing Beyond the Pale this past summer, I learned so much. You know, I'm always learning so much. So that's how I try to approach failure as a whole. It hurts like it does when you make a mistake, when you fail, when you fall short. It hurts. And some failures hurt more than others. But there's lessons to be had. Yeah. So once you've finished hurting a little bit, <laughs> you need to be like, right, what have I learned from this? And what can I apply next time? Uh, so what what writers do you, lo- let's say, do you look up to? Um, who, one writer who I do very much um, look up to, because he is, a, this, a lot of what I described is, is um, you know, I like to, to think of it, emulate it a lot. And it's Ryan Holiday because he's a fantastic writer. He's very nonfiction, but it's very narrative driven. Mm. And I could certainly see Ryan writing a novel at some point in the future. He's got a fantastic writing style. He's wonderful when it comes to research and really going deep. And he writes great books and he's very good at marketing. He was, you know, a fantastic marketer before he became a full-time writer, like a fantastic marketer. But he's not someone who's got so caught up in launching this program and this course and doing all these different things. His Everything that he does seems to be full of purpose. So he's built a business out of his writing career, mm. but it all has purpose. So I look up to him. I also look up to Mark Manson as a writer. Again, for similar reasons for, for Ryan, he writes nonfiction, but it's so narrative driven he's such a good storyteller and i think that is amazing because there's so many non-fiction books out there that are too dry they're too how to mm. and they're just a slightly different variation of a hundred other books out there yet stories once you bring stories into a book you make them unique because stories are always unique how i tell a story is going to be completely different to how you would and how ryan holiday would and how mark manson does so when you find like non-fiction writers like mark manson ryan holiday malcolm gladwell too they're just so fantastic at sharing stories and building narratives into their words that it brings everything to life so those are some of the sort of more business-centered um, authors that i look up to Um, yeah awesome well, uh, <clears throat> what would you say one takeaway for this episode for the audience um i mean we've talked all about writing which i think is fantastic because i've done so many interviews recently and you know it's usually asking about the book rather than about the the craft behind the writing of the book so thank you for asking such wonderful questions and hopefully this has inspired a few people to go yes like i can write a book and my takeaway would be my advice would be to if you're going to write a book commit to writing the best book you can part of that involves writing before the book you need to write a lot of rubbish words before you get to the book whether they're blog posts whether they're journal entries whether they're social media posts you need to write a lot of rubbish before you're ready to write a book the other part of it is writing a book is a journey there's going to be highs there is also going to be lows so commit to it and just enjoy the process as best as you can because when you get to hold something you've created like this in your hand it is a truly proud and monumental moment so if you have been inspired to write a book do it do it it's an amazing journey but do it for the right reasons and commit to it Yeah. Where can people get in touch with you, Matthew? Yeah, well, if you would like to take a close look at Beyond the Pale, just head to beyondbook.co. That's beyondbook.co. 
you can grab a free sample um, on their the first few chapters. So you can grab that. There's also links to where you can buy it on Amazon and thing. And there's also links to my Facebook, Instagram, and also a Facebook group, which takes a lot of the aspects discussed in the book in a more practical setting. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you've watched this and you've got any questions for me, whether about the book itself, about writing a book, please like reach out to me. You'll be able to find my details on beyondbook.co. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matthew, for being here today with me on this episode of the Success Secret Podcast. Amazing. Thank you very much. A real pleasure.